Square Ball Podcast. Hello there, welcome to the show. It's brought to you in association with Levi Solicitors, who will offer you a 10% discount on your legal fees at levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. But because this is the Phil Hay bit, get mm-hmm. a special discount, don't we? On Michael, please be ready this time. Will's probate conveyance. Thank you very much. 15% discount. Been doing my pre season. Yeah. I'm getting sharp. <laughs> uh, if you want that discount, uh, go to Monday Club instead of the square ball. That's levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash Monday Club. I know it's Friday, as we record this. <laughs> I knew the this. one was Wednesday. Yeah, we will get that changed, but that involves people doing things with servers and websites and just, just hang in there. Um, lasting power of attorney? Mm-hmm. It's very important, isn't it? Why don't you tell me why? <laughs> well, incredibly important is what it says in front of me on the sheet. It's just basically because you don't know what's around the corner. And lasting power of attorney, it means that you've got a trusted person appointed to act on your behalf in matters of money, property, or your health and welfare should you not be able to as a result of injury or illness. That does sound important. It is very important, and it goes along with the big three. Wills, probate, conveyancing, 15% on those, 10% on the others. Um, LeviSolicitors.co.uk forward slash Monday Club. Uh, yeah, it is one of the Phil Hay shows here. Hello, Phil. How are you doing? Very, very good. So we have things happening finally at Ellen Road. We thought that um, today we would have a little dive into the stuff that you've been writing about this week. There's been a big article uh, that you've done on The Athletic about the players in and out, positions, um, which, if you're on the video version, you'll be able to see on your screen about now. Look at that. That's clever. There it is. Oh, beautiful. If you're listening, this will make no sense to you whatsoever. But there's Daniel Farker. Yes. And <laughs> and some other pictures. Right. Well, this this is basically... To um, business, Phil. Go for it. Yes. Um, t- uh, the Athletic imitating Twitter, which is now that Fark, Farker has been announced, uh, move on from that, nobody cares anymore, can we have some transfer news, of which there's going to have to be some When you said it was soon. imitating Twitter, I thought it was absolutely collapsing then, and everyone was well, well, jumping ship. No, hopefully <laughs> everybody jumping ship to a newly created Facebook site, which um, isn't great, but it's clearly going to take over the world uh, at some point soon. No, it, it was a bit like that, um, and partly because it took so long to get Farker in the door. Um, there was this general thing of, now he's got a head coach, now then down to business, uh, down to the summer. Um, and as we said loads of times, there's plenty to do. It is starting to get going. We had Robin Koch out the door yesterday to Eintracht Frankfurt, um, season-long loan, which is basically the end of him at Leeds. He'll be a free agent at the end of that and will not be coming back. Um, Brendan Aronson should go to Union Berlin on loan next week. Diego Llorente to Roma is agreed and in place, hasn't been announced, but again, just waiting in the pipeline. So movement in that direction. But needless to say... With the exception of players like Rafinha and Calvin Phillips, nobody's ever too interested in who's going out, particularly if the players who they're happy to see the back of. Everybody wants to know who's coming through the door. Absolutely. Um, just to jump back a step first, because we haven't had the ratification just yet from the EFL for the nope. takeover. It's one of those things where every week that goes by, you hear a new rumour. Like, So the latest one is early next week, but we've had that for the last couple of weeks. So can we place any stock in that, or is it just a case of wait and see? It'll come when it comes. Michael was saying before we came on air that um, he'd said in his last podcast that we're all just waiting to die, which is quite um, you know, quite fitting with the, with the offerings from... Levi solicitors, and it does feel a little bit like that with the takeover, doesn't it? We're all just, we're all just waiting, waiting, waiting. But it, it's, yeah, it, it's. I keep saying this, but it's like how long is a piece of string? Once the EFL get through the paperwork and do all the checks, they'll announce it. Um, I don't think they will be deliberately dragging their feet, but they wouldn't. You know, what the anti Legion United conspiracy, Phil? That everyone yeah, knows about. Yeah, we need to get back into that, don't we? We absolutely. In the EFL. Do. Yeah, it's been um, been three years. I don't think we ever kind of developed a Premier League conspiracy, not properly. There was, there was. Mike Dean and VAR wasn't there, which was mm. was getting close to it. But the EFL is where where that really brews and, and breeds. Um, but yeah, so they they have to do what they have to do with every takeover. Have to go through it. It just takes as long as it takes. But as we've seen with Farca, it hasn't actually stopped that happening. And with transfers, it can't stop transfers happening either because, as Farca was saying himself on Tuesday, we're pretty close to the start of the season now, less than a month ago. I blame the ghost of Brian Mulwiney. <laughs> yes. Well, this was um, going to be my next question, not about the ghost of Brian Mulwiney. Um, we can it, chat about that if you want. I mean, I'm not sure how rich a seam that is we can mind, really. <laughs> uh, I, I just thinking back to, was it the Doncaster playoff final when he came out to meet the team, mm. Mulwiney? And um, it was just, I think they, they cranked the PA system up really loud, didn't they? So yeah. they're going to hear all the booing from the Leeds end. Um, no, I was going to ask you just about the takeover and say, presumably that's not having an impact on their ability to do business. Although it's probably not as tidy financially as it, as it would have been if it was all complete by now. They'd feel much happier making decisions like Farka, for example, um, and players coming in, players going, if it was if the club was solely in the hands of 
49ers enterprises and the takeover had gone through in practical terms especially with Radrazani now over running Sampdoria it doesn't actually make a great difference especially because everybody's expecting the takeover to go through as planned but that was the reason why they delayed um, on appointing a head coach was because they were expecting takeover first head coach second but then you get to the point where pre-season training or testing has started training's due to start on the Wednesday you don't have anybody to actually take it unless you're going to ask poor old Scoobs to to step up again um so yeah it, it had to be done and was done um and it will be the same as I say it will be the same with with players and you can tell on the basis that decisions are being made about players going out that um if they can get incomings in line then then they will happen too quick word if we may about Robin Cox goodbye um montage thing his little graphic his, the way of the world these days, his isn't statement, it? His, his social media people have put that out. Whether they're his words or not, I don't know. Um, doesn't strike me as very sincere, does it? I mean, it's, it's very, very hard. I know these things can never be perfect, right? Somebody is always going to not like it. But it's very hard for me to think, I'm glad you've enjoyed some good personal growth at, at my football club while you've just helped to take it down. If, if the same picture with, yeah, I'm off. Yeah. Would probably have summed it up enough. Would you, would you prefer it if he just said... Cheers and like, that. This this last year has been dismal. Pretty pleased to be getting out of here. <laughs> Bye. Would that, um, <laughs> would that suit you better? Well, would it not go down a bit better if it just went, do you know what? I know I've been shit. We've been shit. Probably best if I went and did something else now. I, I, yeah, I, it's, it's part of the fact though, isn't it, that over time, football has moved from people just saying what they like and speaking openly to everything being managed and everything being controlled and statements like that being written in advance and kind of picked over to make sure that um, that they read right to the people who are sticking them out. I think when you've been relegated, um, it's very difficult to say anything which is going to strike a chord. There are some players who can get out of relegation season um, without, you know, with, with the reputation intact. Um, there are some who, who definitely can't. I don't know that I particularly look at Robin Koch as the kind of main protagonist in the reason why they went down, but he didn't have a good season. And you can't say that the, you know, the money invested to bring him from Freiburg wasn't a huge amount in the context of the Premier League. It was like £12 million. Pounds, but it hasn't amounted to much. Um, they are getting a loan fee from um, Eintracht Frankfurt. Um, Eintracht are paying all of his wages for this season. So there is money involved, but it's not as if they made a profit on somebody that they would very much have expected to appreciate and value. And as you say, those statements, they, they tend to just, oh, looking at the general reaction last night, they tend to just leave you saying, OK, well, off you go. This talk of a loan fee, I'm guessing not. A huge amount of money. I don't know how much it is, but I don't think it'll be massive. No, I wouldn't have thought so. The, the bigger thing for Leeds would be to move his wages off the wage bill. And because he wanted to play at a higher level and saw himself playing at a higher level, he wasn't... So did we, Phil. So did we. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, um, that is the stock answer to this, isn't it? Yeah, well, of why course did, it is. Why, I said it the other week, why didn't he try that when he was playing for us? But, but you know, in the same way as, as you were saying to me, why do players have relegation release clauses why does that all seem to be in the favour because there is a point in time where clubs really want to sign these players and in order to sign them like if you go to if somebody headhunts you for any job you have to offer incentives and you have to kind of you have to kind of play it their way and um, which catches up with you when you get into these circumstances um i think you know had, had Leeds not been going down um and not had such a poor season i think it's likely that Koch would have signed a contract extension at some point last season but that was off the table at the point where it looked like they were they were going to slip out of the Premier League. He's just um, too damn good for relegation, isn't he? Too damn good. Uh, <laughs> well, listen, all I'd say is he's not alone in moving on, no. is he? There's going to be a few. No. Uh, well, we'll get to the centre-backs in due course. Should we start with goalkeeper then? Yes, um, why not? And we'll sort of work our way through the team. Keeper, Melier. Melier. Well, no bids for Melier yet. I, I don't think last season or the season before has done a huge amount for his reputation or you know, his, his options in the market. But I think there will be some, the club certainly expect there to be some and, and expect them to be good enough. Um, to be able to accept there is it does seem to be this feeling that it would be for the best really for him to find fresh pastures start again a little bit you know um, develop in a way that he hasn't been developing at Leeds and also for Leeds to move on uh, and, and find somebody else for the championship I mean for what it's worth I could see Millie actually being pretty good in the championship and being of, of value to Leeds but it's one of those where you know that that kind of thing where relationships reached a certain point and, and perhaps it suits everybody just to kind of go the, the separate ways. Um, Robles, out of contract, he has been asked to come back for pre-season, but as a last time of asking, hasn't as yet because he will have other options and he'll be con considering what to do next, uh, which really leaves um, Christopher Klassen as 
the only thing that you would consider to be an experienced goalkeeper um, aside from Melier. Klassen, I think, will stick around. The plan was for him to, to be second choice um, or thereabouts this season. But they will have to be in the market for somebody else. And I think Farke and the club, when the season starts or when the transfer window closes, certainly see themselves having a different number one. And who's that likely to be then? We've seen some names in the round already. Darlow, very much. Carl Darlow, very much in the mix. Um, a name everybody will know, player everybody will have seen, somebody with loads of championship experience. And I think with, you know, he's 32 now, but with 100% fit the bill. Um, they've looked at James Trafford over at Manchester City, but it looks like he will go to Burnley. Burnley trying to get that one done. Um, the figure we, we quoted in The Athletic was almost £20 million, which again, just makes you realise once you get promoted what you can do. You know, a young keeper from City and there's £20 million that they're trying to, to spend on him. And there are a couple of others who Leeds have looked at previously and have had on the radar for a while before. So Freddie Woodman, who's over at Preston, Angus Gunn, who is down um, at Norwich, who they very nearly did, I think, in Bielsa's first summer, if not his second. I think it was the first summer when in the end they signed um, Jamal Blackman from Chelsea. Um, so options out there and it does seem as if they're thinking quite domestically. Centre backs, um, Nat Phillips is the one that um, that came to light last week. Yeah, Phillips um, is well thought of at Liverpool, but seems to want a permanent move. He's been in and out of the team there, you know, infrequently. hasn't played too much, but has has still been involved as as a first teamer. He was on loan at Bournemouth in the season last season when Bournemouth went up um, the second half of that twenty one twenty two. Right sided um, central defender, good player, good um, good asset to take on, I think, but not particularly cheap I think you'd be looking at about 10 million pounds for him so it's the thing with the players that Leeds are talking about they are I think most of them are attainable um, but not necessarily easily attainable if you know what I mean you're going to have to work for them um, you're going to have to pay money he's certainly one of those you mentioned before about obviously Cox on the way out Charlie Creswell is this a season where where he's going to feature more do you fancy I would like to think so yeah we going back to January when Leeds seemed not determined to sell him but seemed quite happy to sell him I was a little bit perplexed by that particularly because at that stage you couldn't have said with any certainty that they were going to stay up and I went down to watch Creswell at Millwall um, the start of last season and he didn't make make it to the end of the season because he fractured an eye socket and needed surgery but he is fit again and he's away with England's under 21s at the moment and it was it was definitely a learning curve for him down at Millwall it was it was good in parts it wasn't so good in others but towards the end of the season he seemed to really settle and seemed to be really impressive down there and he, a little bit like Cody Dramey, just seems to me like the sort of player, particularly at his age, who you should absolutely be willing to to rely on and lean on a bit now. Doesn't mean he necessarily needs to be first choice, um, but I kind of look at him and think, given that he's already in the building, how easy would it be to get another centre-back that is as competent and, and capable as him? He, he looks good. I think they, they should stick with him, yeah. Max Verber? Uh, any yeah. chances of him staying? Verba's an interesting one because a bit like Christensen at the start of the window, he indicated that he'd be happy to stay or you know, can potentially willing to stay. Um, but as you've seen with Christensen, there's been interest in, uh, in him from Roma, which isn't as far down the line as the interest in um, Urenti, which has basically reached the point where he will he will go back on loan. Um, Verba, there is some interest in him, but again, it's pretty speculative at this point. Again. He seems to me to be somebody... That, there's been a lot of discussion so far about players Leeds would like to keep. You know, Tyler Adams and Jack Harrison, Nonto. Um, I think Rodrigo, ideally, but it seems pretty unlikely to me that, that, that he will stick around. I wouldn't be at all surprised, actually, if he ends up getting some offer from Saudi Arabia the way it's going over there. But Verber looks to me like somebody who'd be really good to build around if you could keep him. And I kind of picture, you know, Creswell and Verber as... Um, is your right-sided, left-sided centre-back or somebody like Nat Phillips if he was to come in? That straight away feels like a dead solid base there. Um, so again with Verba, because of his standing, because of where he came from, because he probably doesn't see himself as a championship player. Um, and also with him, I really don't think you can point any fingers at him particularly for last season. I thought he was decent enough and as decent as he could be coming into that defence. Um, they'll, they'll probably have to see how it goes. Uh, Phillips, there's interest from Feyenoord. Can we compete with Feyenoord if they come in for him? I'd probably not, no. I mean, if, if Feyenoord get really active on that one, then it becomes difficult. But Feyenoord, I would think, will have other options as well. Fullbacks, Junior Furpo, any argument for keeping Junior, bless him? I don't think so. I think the club would like him to go. Um, Left-back-wise, you've seen the links with Ryan Manning. Makes sense because um, very capable championship left-back. But interestingly, there's also been some discussion about Charlie Taylor. 
over at Burnley. Um, you can hit me with your thoughts on that one because it was um, kind of mixed response when um, you know when the article ran to to Taylor um, because of the way he left. I have my own view on that, really, but interested to hear yours. He's spoken about it, hasn't he, since he's done an interview where he said, basically, look, I was young, naive, just wanted to... Misadvised, sec- I think, yeah, he said. Yeah, secure my future and was told to basically say, I don't want to play. Yeah. And then, as we know, Gary Monk made it public, which throws him under the bus in the eyes of the Leeds fans. I don't know. I, it's funny, isn't it? Because I can, as I mentioned on one of the shows in the last couple of weeks, I've still got great grievances against Gordon Watson for that dive against Sheffield Wednesday <laughs> in 1991. <laughs> And so, you know, we, we have we have long memories at Leeds, don't we? Yet, with Charlie Taylor, I do feel like I can kind of understand it. I can understand why he has to sit that game out, given what was on the table, as much as it hurts us to think that our young star fullback wants to leave to go to Burnley to play in the Premier League. The, the problem there, as I saw it, was his decision not to play in that final game at Wigan. And I think there was nothing on that game. Leeds were not going to get into the playoffs. They needed a swing of about 20 goals or something like that. So it wasn't going to happen. Um as I recall, there was nothing in it for Wigan either. And it was nothing like the most competitive game you've ever seen. I, I know there's risk involved um, and there always is. But then, you know, you, you saw at the other end of the scale, somebody like Berardi playing in that game against Derby and, and doing his knee when he had no contract on the table. I know that Berardi was at a different stage of his career, but in many ways, you know, that made it more difficult for him because at his age uh, and, and with that sort of injury, it becomes difficult to find other employers. Whereas Taylor was young, he was at a, the really early stage of his career and, and doing extremely well. I think had that not happened, had he played at Wigan and then gone to Burnley, people would have been more understanding and, and more tolerant of it. Um, on the other hand, I, I do kind of look back at that period for Leeds United as an era where people had to look out for themselves. You know, it, it did breed that sort of atmosphere because of so much that was going on. And again, to go back to the interview that I did with Ross McCormack, and I know that, again, it's a bit contentious, some of what went on with him, but... He talks about the fact, you know, Cellino and the club moaning about him not going on the pre-season tour to Italy um, in 2014. He says he was down at Fulham at the time because he'd already been sold. You know, the deal had already been done. Um, and so it gives you an example of, of how it was. Um, and I think I think Taylor probably was poorly advised. But at the same time, I think he was probably doing what he felt was, was best for his career. And I can't get away from the thought that there's barely been a more competent or good left back better left back at Leeds in the past decade he whenever we talk about left backs and it is just such a problem area for Leeds has been really since I started doing this job yeah. you know Michael Gray he was he was good Stephen Warnock he was kind of steady um Andrew Hughes actually in that season that they got promoted even though he was a midfielder was probably as dependable there as as most other players certainly compared to some of the actual left backs who they they brought in um, but Taylor was Taylor was pretty rock solid. Rock solid. Got up and down the pitch. Good player. And has had a lot of games as well since then. It's not. Yeah. Like, it's not like he's he's left and he's been playing. You know, half a dozen games yeah, a and season and coming back. No. I mean, the thing is, if he if he comes back and you do an interview, you address it right up front. It takes all the heat out of it. It's done with. He should he, agree he, to play for free for three years. <laughs> <laughs> you, play, you play well for a month. And everybody says good signing, yeah. yeah and, and everybody would welcome him back. It's just we're, we're, it's a bit pantomime, isn't it? I that did say I, I did see a funny tweet, but can, I can, can you can can you really really get exercised about Charlie Taylor? No, no. I mean to go <laughs> back to go back to that same same sort of era. You were looking at the six six and all like players from that came back, didn't they? you know? Dukara came back from that and lashed in a volley, and everyone went ah. I think Fair came enough. back from that is probably a little bit generous. I suspect well. that in, in the eyes of a lot of people, they were never, never really redeemed. I was going to say, bunch, I, I, I saw a tweet that said, I can't remember who, who authored it, so please do forgive me, but it was, um, I can't believe that we're going to finally replace Charlie Taylor with Charlie Taylor. <laughs> that's that's kind of how it how it feels. But that taking out all the politics, that would that'd be a good signing, no? Yeah, and there was talk as well of a, a couple of left backs. Let's get um, Manning. Because you've been saying you wanted all the left backs, Manning and Charlie Taylor. Well, it's not a bad point, and I think it's something that they'll have to consider is how much they need there. You've got Leo Hilda coming back. Um, he was at Rotherham last season, who was more of a centre back at Celtic, but has always had this thing around him of oh, he can play as a left back if if he needs to. I'd love to see Leeds get out of the can do this if he needs to um, mindset. But Stuart if, Dallas coming if, back? Yeah, um, I mean, who has played absolutely everywhere. But I think we've now settled on as a centre mid, really, haven't we? Um, but yeah, I, so perhaps two would not be a terrible idea, but one solid, high-quality left-back 
good enough for the championship would be a good start. Is it too much to ask? Surely it's not too much to ask. Are Burnley definitely willing to let him go? Because he, he was he's, starting games them last year. He's got a year to go, I think. Um, I suspect there'd be a deal to be done there, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the other side then? So, Cody Drame, is it his time to shine? Because we've, we've heard less noise about right-backs. Yes, he is back um, training, looking good. Um, was very good at Luton last year. I'm not... Com- I, I think Ailing will be much better in the Championship than he was in the Premier League last season. Um, if Christensen goes on loan to Roma, that would leave Ailing and Drame. It doesn't seem to me to be much point in having three of them for that position. And also, I think if Drame isn't starting to push through, what what is he actually doing? And to be fair to him, having done well at Cardiff, you know, player of the year and having been there for only half a season and then helped to get Luton promoted, why is he going to want to sit around doing nothing this season? I, I feel like he has to play. It's now or never, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Or sell him. You know? Yeah, that's but, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I feel but, like he needs a, he needs a run of games as well. He's, you know, he's clearly good enough for the league. Yeah. I was going to say, I think he needs a run of games as well because when he's come into the team, first team, he's never looked particularly good but then it's always been in slightly difficult circumstances because of injuries and he's never he's never had a, a run of even three or four games has he to to get settled in there so you'll get a very different structure under Farker as well to to Marsh last season um and also I think to to Bielsa fullbacks will push on and do but um you know they, they were always very good Norwich at being defensively tight and tidy at the same time so it probably is actually quite a good team to play in as a fullback into midfield then, and uh, if we go off the, the the premise, if we work off the premise that Daniel Farker generally likes a sort of four two three one ish thing, um, midfielders, central midfielders, then whether you class them as holding or you're straight out and out central midfielders, tends to go for kind of one one of each, doesn't he? One that yeah. sits deeper and one. That... But but he likes it to be hardcore in there. He does yeah. that. That part of his team is pretty crucial to the way it all works. Talk to me about Tyler Adams then, because that's the that's the really interesting one this week. Yes. Um. Well. Again. I've kind of repeated this loads of times, but they would love him to stay. They'd absolutely love him to stay. And the thing with uh, Adams at the moment is he isn't, he obviously had this hamstring injury um, at the back end of last season uh, and the operation that ruled him out of the the, the closing run of games. He isn't fully fit at this stage, um, although Leeds are hoping that he would be for the start of the season. And and they, they they would love him to be the kind of, focal point of the team you know or a focal point of the team somebody they can they can build around and there does seem to be I mean Villa very keen on him um other clubs would, would take him too there does seem to be though this sense that it might be more realistic to ask him and there might be a more realistic chance of persuading him than perhaps with somebody like say Rodrigo or Jack Harrison I think with Adams they would they would like to put their eggs in that basket if they can but the midfield again, is, is going to need some work because Rocker is still here, but Real Betis are very keen on him, think that they'll take him. I don't see Leeds standing in the way of that if um, if it's presented to them. They could lose Adams. You know, if Adams gets an offer that he doesn't want to turn down, I'll leave a, a big, big hole there. At the moment, again, like Robles, um, Adam Forshaw was asked to come back for pre-season. It hadn't the last time I asked because he's been made this offer now, what happened with Forshaw was when he signed his previous contract, it was 12 months with the option of a 12-month extension beyond that. Leeds didn't take that option up because they wanted to make him a different offer, which took into account more the injuries that he'd been suffering from. So he is considering that. I think the club are hopeful that he'll take it up. But until he does, you know, he's he's clearly not going to be not going to be involved. Um, so they are going to need to recruit there, I would think. At the same time, definitely expect them to push JB through more. Um, and I think they should push him through more. I think this is the time to be to be actively laying it on somebody like him and saying, look, you're going to have a decent opportunity now. And they do rate him. Um, a lot of people in the game rate him as well. I think if you were to put him on the market, I don't think you would struggle to find clubs who would who would want to have a go there. Um, Archie Gray, uh, he, he just seems to come from the genetically modified school of Erling Haaland. Every time you see him, he gets taller and bigger. He looks like he's about 25 when he's actually <laughs> 17. He's just physically amazing um, and also technically very good. So how how hard and how far you could push him, you know, in, in what would be his first, really his first professional season, um, or active one in the championship is a question that Farker would have to answer. I suspect JB's probably a bit more ready for that. But very, very talented. And, and again, somebody that you would like to see play if if he can. But I think beyond that, and what I was saying about Farker, you know, putting a, a lot of importance on that, that combination of two midfielders, assuming that the formation is the same as it was before, I think he would want recruitment there. 
we've done a show actually, um, our members' show that's coming out across this weekend where we're talking about the midfielders, and it feels like maybe you'd like to see um, Archie Gray start to just push onto the periphery here, maybe be brought on in some games. You know, let's say we're ahead in a game. Imagine the novelty of that. Oh. And then, then that's when you can start to introduce these young players when the pressure, it's not like a Hail Mary where you're chucking a kid on to save it like we did with Gelhart a yeah. lot in the last couple of years. Yeah, which is exactly how you're supposed to manage younger players and exactly how an academy and a, a head coach would, would like to do it. I, I think there are quite a few players in the 21s who are definitely falling in the, the gap between the 21s and the first team. Matteo Joseph, probably another one of those. Sonny Perkins, potentially. JB, who if they're not playing in the first team, are only going to get a certain amount out of 21's football. Um, I mean, I went to the the game in which Leeds won promotion against Forest, which was obviously a waste of time because then they completely um, redrafted and redrew the, the 21 set up. So, um, so it, it, it didn't matter um, in that sense. But they were streets ahead of Forest. You know, they really were. You could tell from yeah. the... Uh, you, I think you oh, went yeah, to the I game. There, yeah, you yeah. could tell from the early minutes that it yeah. was just going to be a complete walkover and Forest offered next to nothing. Um, so... It's very hard not to look at a lot of those players and think they need, you know, they, they need a bit more pressure on them. They need a, a higher standard um, to, to keep them keep them moving forward. And the championship is definitely, it's really hard physical league, the championship, but in terms of ability, it's definitely an easier league to blood players in than the Premier League. Premier League, you get found out so easily, but I think in the championship, there is a bit more scope to, to push players through. And as I've said before, they've got all these academy players who they've spent money on. So, you know, now should be the time. We've seen some names um, enter the mix this week in terms of central midfield reinforcements because we clearly need them, as you were saying. Um, Gustavo Hamer has been one that's been doing the yeah, rounds for do a while. Really like him, yeah. If they like him, get it done. <laughs> well, no point saying that to me. Go on, Hammond. Really? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the money. Um, he would, um, yeah, he'd be good. Goals, assists, very talented. I think his contract's up in 2024. So again, the, what you know is that when you start trying to deal with or trade with championship clubs, unless you're talking about players that they actively want to move on, um, they're unlikely to be hugely helpful in the way that Coventry, I mean, obviously leads to a different division at, at this stage, but Coventry were not um, in any way cooperative when it came to Gokeresh in January. You know, they were absolutely adamant he was staying. Was the right decision, got into the playoff final, very nearly got them promoted. Um, but yeah, Hamer's Hamer somebody they've liked for a long time. And um, we've seen Sam Field as well, who's at QPR mentioned. I think again falls into the same bracket of midfielder who would do your job. Get him done sure. as well. Yeah, yeah, go on. I mean, Michael has you have said many times, just get them all signed, all the central midfielders. When we, I thought we were doing it last summer, and then we went and sold click, didn't we? During yeah. the season, undid the plan of just getting more central midfielders in. But yeah, get more, get like six or seven. Yeah, twelve. <laughs> yeah, four or five left backs should have just about cover it. Masengo as well, the young lad from Bristol City. Um, yes, out of contract, good player. Uh, there'll be European interest in him. I could see that one being being slightly difficult um he would be there would be a compensation fee for him as well um, yeah. in, if you were signing him in england um and you've also got um we've been long since rumored to be interested in is it alex scott who's also at bristol yeah um, he's he's another one who will cost cost money um and i don't see bristol city being overly keen to to let him go to somebody else in the same division but he's a good player yeah very good player money talks though doesn't it that's it does, the thing yeah. money talks what about um in front of them then, because it feels like the, the the forwards, the players tucked in behind the number nine, are pretty crucial to the operation of Farka's system. I think in particular because there's been a lot of noise about Buendia being crucial to the Norwich system. Yeah. And he, he played in sort of, it was a, a number 10, but almost drifting out to the right type role, almost a bit like Pablo Hernandez. Yeah, he was really flexible, but also really good. And, you know, dead influential for them in that season where they, they won won the title, really big player. Um. Farker tends to play with line of three behind the um, behind the single striker, and and at times when I've watched Norwich, it was almost like a line of three tens. So it wasn't that they didn't have any width, but you'd see that a lot of the width would come from the fullbacks, um, and he did tend to look for quite a bit of creativity there. I mean, interestingly, we haven't spoken about the wings, and that's largely because they probably have you know a lot of what they need already. I th- I think some of them will leave. Um, I think the odds probably say that Harrison will get an offer that Leeds have to take at some point, but perhaps not. But, you know, that's kind of how it feels. There is there are clubs looking at him like Everton and, and others. But, you know, Nonto's there. Dan James um, will be back next week to train. He'll he'll be involved this season. Um, could actually be quite quite handy in the Championship. You know, having looked at that initially, and, th- and I don't think it will necessarily ever be value for money at £25 million, but having looked at that at the outset and when he left and thought, you know, what was all that about? Um, it 
you know, somebody that, that has pace, you, you could definitely make use of in the championship. So, again, I, I, it seems as if the positions that they really need to look at, goalkeeper, centre-back, left-back, centre-mid, centre-forward. And then there is this question of if Farker does want an out-and-out out 10, a kind of, or somebody in the Buendia mould, who is that? Because looking at the squad at the moment, I don't think I necessarily see anybody who instantly slots in there or looks like a you know an easy fit. Any candidates that you can think that Leeds might go for in that position? Because it's, it's a tough one to recruit for, isn't it? Because players like that are often in demand. In demand and, and expensive. I think, I, I haven't had any names mentioned for that area, but up front, um, Joe Pirro at Swansea, I think would be a, a shoe in for any championship club would score you goals. Leeds do like him. Um, Sam Surridge at Forest as well, another player they, they I've spoken about could look at. Um, good, solid championship signings, I think. Not mm. spectacular, you know, not... Not grizzled championship bastards. Not showbiz. Well, <laughs> I sort of think that Pirro probably is these days, um, with a bit of finesse as well. Yeah. Um, Hamer knows his way about the division, no problem at all. Um, and, you know, guys like Charlie Taylor, Ryan Manning, probably do fit that category, don't they? Mm. Yeah. Maybe maybe the Grizzle Championship bastard is, is Are you a thinking of like Graham Kavanagh? Yeah, I'm just thinking like it's a genre that's probably expired now, isn't it? Sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm just I'm just harking back to back to my youth. Um Jorginho Ruta has been featured quite heavily in the club's publicity. Yeah. He's been earmarked as a as a wide forward by yeah. Daniel Farker. Important to probably mention that, rather than a number nine. Well, somebody was saying to me that in most of the, the interviews and presentations that were done, everybody kind of, oh, everybody, most people identified Ruter as a winger, you know, or a wide forward, particularly um, playing on, on the right-hand side, which he did a lot of at Hoffenheim, which I think, again, adds some context to the decision to sign him for the centre-forward area, which was what Leeds needed uh, in, in January, and, and that has been an error. But I was saying in the squad audit that we did at the end of May that he was somebody that Leeds had decided they, they would like to keep despite the money that had been set aside for him. And that still seems to be the case, yeah. And again, I, I think he could have a very good season in the championship. He, he could, and in theory, should absolutely rip it up, no? Um, well, he should be much better than he was in the Premier League, but I, I still don't feel like any of us have really seen enough of him to, to know for sure. I feel like he needs to get established in the team, doesn't he, and get yeah. an actual place, rather than just being brought off the bench to try and salvage something, which was essentially his role last year, often into a position we didn't, he didn't really suit. I mean, the, half the time it wasn't even that, was it? it? Wasn't even coming off the bench to salvage anything. It was just kind of sat there with a blanket <laughs> over him. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of. It's funny, isn't it? That I've I've got so little sympathy for for Robin Cock and his um, team's statement that they put out about his personal development and I mean, I had a smashing three years there or whatever it was. That I I look at Ruta because he's new and because of the price tag and he's just a, a kid. I kind of um, I want him to succeed. I've got a lot of sympathy for him. And I'm kind of right behind him. Yeah, I, f I feel the same, actually. I, I, I want like, to ruffle his hair and say, go on. The stuff that went wrong last year, none of it was really his fault, was it? No. The fact that he cost so much money and we didn't need him. I don't I don't, I don't, don't see anybody getting at Ruter over this specifically. I think it's more of a broader complaint about transfer policy strategy. Um, and, you know, if someone if Leeds go to him and say, we're going to sign you for £35 million and you say yes, not really your fault, is it, if you then don't, um, fit in too well there were little bits of what he did from time to time that made me think there's a definite footballer there and if you watch back some of his highlights from Hoffenheim um, he does look like a really talented decent footballer um, so maybe the championship is just what he needs to, to get himself going you, you reckon they'll keep him then he's, he's almost I certainly looks like it at the moment bit yeah. of a shoe in, yeah. and the, yeah. the clips of him from Hoffenheim his best bits are all cutting in from the wings aren't they and shooting into, shooting across goal as, he's, as yeah. he cuts inside So, like you said as well I also don't think that a club make a big play on social media and everything else in the way that they have of Ruta for the past week or so if there is not a, some intention there to keep him. So when you look at these players, the, the non-strikers like Dan James, Jorginho, Ruta, who else do you put into that bracket? Is there a chance that we can keep Willie Nonto? Because he's an it interesting is. one. There's a very, it's almost nebulous around him, isn't it? Because it seems to me that there's no, is there no release clause? But Leeds would probably listen to a bid if it was high enough. Where, where does it land? Well, the, the, the problem with him is that if you get a big bid for him, you have to seriously consider it. And if I was a, a decent European club, I'd be pretty tempted on the basis of last season. He coped really well with the Premier League and he's so young, so much development potential that he'd be worth them. Um, 
worth getting into. Just on the subject of Robin Koch, did you see the the photos of them pulling down the um, the poster of him on Ellen Road? You know, the big poster to the right yeah. side of the East stand. Yeah, I, gone I, already. Yeah, that is that is efficient, isn't it? Um, I've noticed that if you if you go in these shops, I think I, don't, I can't remember which. It might be the White Rose Centre, or it might be the one in the City Centre, or whatever. But the the graphics for a long time have been Rafinha and Calvin Phillips there. I don't know if Adidas are perhaps responsible for those and then I'll have to touch them until Adidas it's like, it's like give the you the green light, but get them down. Yeah, it's like a classic Christmas calendar thing, isn't it? Where, you know, you open it and the first picture is of Calvin Phillips who's gone. Well, know, I was going to say, it's, it's the problem we face every year with our calendars, isn't it? Well, I think last, we did deliberately put Rafinha as December, I think, yeah. last year, wasn't it? Because we were like, I'll be gone. Give me. Give me. I mean, it's, Rafinha's an interesting case, actually, from his performances at the end of that season that ultimately kept us up and and made his transfer to Barcelona a lot more complicated for him but he you didn't feel like he was phoning it in as a, as a way of getting a move out whereas you could look at I guess Cock and Aronson and these people are on the way out now and go did you care that much that you wanted to or did you think oh well it's easier for me to get out if we're down and it's an easy accusation to make isn't it but it's also a natural conclusion to draw because they're human as well. So if, if there's no, if you've got no real skin in the game, if you know that you're fine regardless, then it's going to take the edge off a little bit, isn't it, maybe? Or are we just being stupid I naive football fans? It does, yeah. I, I don't think it's necessarily a conscious decision, like you say, but maybe just a tiny bit. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's certainly the way that... You're thinking back to your late stage ITV career, aren't you? There was, there was very little skin in the game, right, for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose they'll think of McKenney in the closing weeks of the season and... I don't imagine anybody wants relegation on the record because it doesn't look good. And you get remembered as part of that pool who, who took a club down. But it was quite apparent by that stage that the loan from Juventus was not going to become permanent. So you do start to think, you know, where is everybody at with, with this one mentally? I think Rafinha had a few things in his favour. One was that he was an incredibly talented player. So it wasn't as if he was going out of Ellen Road with much in the way of debate about is this guy actually any good? You know, was was he a good player or not? Everybody accepted that he was. He made a difference to Leeds staying up. Um, he had that that element of talent about him, which meant that everybody was realistic about him not being at Leeds forever. And that if he was saying, I think I can play at higher level than this, unless you were being ludicrously partisan, you'd had to say, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you, you definitely would. But what's, um, what's quite funny with Rafinha is that, you know, the, the talk of the Barcelona move was going on from... January onwards and given that Chelsea were trying to sign him and it was no it's Barcelona even though Barcelona were in a mess financially and it was hideously complicated to get that deal over the line in the end you know that was the one he was holding out for um, so in those circumstances you could quite easily have had supporters who were saying not very happy about this but he fell on the right side of the line I think on the basis that he, he'd been you know really impressive he'd been a, a bit of a sensation at Leeds and people people kind of understood where he was coming from a little bit like Phillips to City I think I know again some people would like to have seen him stick around but he's gone to City he hasn't played much but they have won the treble you know got an Amazon documentary as well yeah, has, yeah. made by um, Neo Studios I think wasn't it indeed Rad- yeah. Radrazani's company yes. so, so that's nice for him yeah he was tweeting about that yes tweeting about some other things yes you got any thoughts on that Phil not really no <laughs> <laughs> just back to uh, back to Willie Nonto then and I guess that if you're drawing comparisons with Rafinha, he's younger, isn't he? So it's not like Rafinha needs to move now in his mid twenties to, you know, enjoy the peak of his career. If you know we have to accept that footballers move on, um, he's going to do that further down the line potentially, or he grows with us. There's, there's an option there to, to, I guess, make him stay. I dare say he'd, he'd prefer to play somewhere higher up right now. But contracts a contract, isn't it? There are two reasons why he needs to stay. One is he's a good player, um, and he he will will make a difference next season. The other is, and you know, Fark touched on this, there's so little time before the start of the season that you do need some existing players who can make a big impact for you without you actually having to bring others in. So obviously they do need signings and they do need to recruit, but it would be nice to have a skeleton of players who you kind of think, well, that as a starting point is very, very reliable. You know, if you had Verber and you had Creswell and you had Drami, and you had Tyler Adams, and you had Nonto. You know, there is there is a group of footballers who I think you could confidently expect to do very, very well in the championship. So you're almost building, despite everything, you're starting from kind of position of strength because you already have that um, in the building. Whereas I think what Leeds can't afford to do, given that time is so short and the, the first game is coming around, is to be in a position where they've lost so much of their existing talent that they're almost starting from scratch. I mean, to go back to Farker's Norwich team, 
part of the reason they were able to bounce straight back is because they managed to keep Buendia for a season and they did keep Pukki as well. Who And it was their goals and assists that essentially got them up the second time. Mm. I think Rodrigo as well. And like I say, I, I think Rodrigo will leave. But having looked like such a good finisher in the Premier League last season, you could only see him going to town in the Championship. So somebody like that, it's, you know, it, it feels like... Um, Doping's not the right word, but you know, it feels like having a ringer in the team. You know, you've got a Spain international up front um, and you say in the championship, I don't think that'll happen. Um, but you know, those sort of players in there give you a good a good starting point, give you a better chance. What about our, our other international number nine? Well, you beat me to the punch there. I was going to say, <laughs> and what of Patrick Bamford in all this? Bamford is here. He's been involved, um, been getting over injury again, which he had towards the end of last season. Um I wonder with that one, it feels to me that if Bamford decides that he wants to stay and um, wants to, to have a go in the championship, then he then he will, most likely. Um, I think there is this possibility that after what went on last season and the fact that it's been difficult for him for a while, that if it felt like it was better for him to, to move on and go somewhere else, then people might not object to that either. He also, he also sort of falls into that, what you were saying about keeping an established skeleton, even though people are a little bit fed up with him, which I think is probably the fairest way to describe yeah. it. Yeah, I think he does, but only if he's fit enough to play and uh, that is, you know, and play regularly and that's the point. If they get that, somebody else in, not necessarily to replace him, but someone there who can be played as a number nine so it's not relying on Pat Bamford all the time to get the goals. When this, he's feel, not, this feels like a million podcasts over the last two or three years, doesn't it? Yeah. Just, but we've, we've said about, you know, perhaps this is a... You know, the new broom is Leeds doing the obvious thing sometimes rather than shooting for the moon or doing these hit and hopes or these these uh, Victor Auto fixer uppers or whatever it might be. Just do the obvious thing. So if you can get that number nine, if it is someone like Pirro, fingers crossed, it then offers you just a little bit of comfort from relying on Bamford all the time. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, and it adds goals to your team. Um, I think we said in the podcast earlier this week that one of the things Farker was talking about in his interview was the need to have probably 75 goals in your team to give you a a uh, fair chance of getting out of the division. I mean, in the form of Dan James, Ruta, if we can keep Nonto, there are goals in that side, should don't be. there? There's a yeah, lot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely should be goals. Um, and then if you sign a proven striker, somebody like Piro, who seems to go at about one from every two games in, in the league, um, that can only help. What about the financial aspect of all this then, Phil? Because when we've spoken about the in, still impending takeover from the, from the 49ers, um, we expect Leeds to have a little bit more financial comfort, but that doesn't escape the fact that they still owe 50 million quid in transfer yeah. fees this summer, um, which presumably now, given that we're past the 1st of July, have gone out. And it, it doesn't um, it doesn't move you on either from the need to comply with P&S um, and to, to keep your finances in order. So a lot of people have asked about the, the loan deals that are going on at the moment, you know, the, the um, outgoing loan deals, Koch being one, as an example. So well, why... I mean, my question was going to be, where's the money coming from if we need to sell? Yeah. Well, for example, he comes off the wage bill, so that helps with profit and sustainability. Um, that, that reduces your wage bill to an extent. And then little by little, as others go as well, I mean, obviously, like loan fee coming in for, for Koch, not sure of the level of it, but, you know, a little bit of cash there. Your rent he goes, he moves off the wage bill. Aronson, you know, who, who probably won't be on a small wage, I wouldn't imagine. Um, that that can make things easier. It, it certainly eases the financial pressure. The indication has always been that there'd be money coming in from the 49ers to help with this. And it's going to be needed. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. The will and should be players who they take fees from. Guys like Melier, for example, if they do sell him, there should be a, a reasonable fee for him. Um, but yeah, it, it, it'd be a challenge between time and finances. Yeah, it's difficult when you get relegated. It is, and, and this summer particularly, I feel. It's interesting, isn't it, that some of the names that have been circulated as the ones that might be for sale are the ones that represent the best from a profit and sustainability financial fair play point of view for example Melier who we will have from a because basically their value when you buy them is then written off over the value of the length of the contract sorry so if it's a five million pound signing for five years it's one million pounds a year yeah. that you effectively and I'm doing air quotes now but lose from a financial fair play point of view so yeah. someone like Melier is essentially paid for now but if you sell them for 20 million quid you get to book all that immediately from a financial fair play point of view so um it doesn't come in over four or five years or whatever it is that you sell them it comes in immediately so it's like a 19 million pound profit or whatever so there's, there's a huge so and that's not to confuse it with real money by the way that's different no, from real money and, it's, and, it's how profit and sustainability works it's, and also you have to be slightly careful with that because you 
and it's it's the thing that clubs usually do, which is deal with the now rather than what's coming down the line. But obviously, if you bury it in one set of accounts, it's not there in future accounts to to level it out as well. But you're right, and I think somebody like Jack Harrison, for example, they would get a very good fee for. Um, you would think twenty million plus for him. Um, but weakened in terms of negotiations in the way that they would have been with Phillips and Rafinha um, last summer. It was interesting with Rafinha. They kind of felt that if they went down, Barcelona might pay in excess of his release clause because they wanted to get the deal done and they didn't want somebody else to um, to intervene. But you do lose your ability to, to get maximum value for these players when this happens. So, yeah, do we sell... You know, is, is like 20 million, is that enough? Is it 30 million enough? It depends on who's coming in, doesn't it? It oh. depends on who's coming in and how you structure the transfers. It's not going to be straightforward. They will have to be careful when it comes to PNS, but at the same time, they're going to have to be aggressive um, to a degree that gives them a good chance of getting promoted. I mean, does, does it also matter how much risk they want to take? That's, that's part of it, I suppose, yes. I suppose isn't it? Yes, yeah, because you know that down the line, you'll lose your parachute payments. You know that down the line, if you do breach PNS rules and you're still in the championship, that the EFL will, will nobble you for that and, and it will restrict what you're actually able to do. Um, so, yeah, it, the, there has to be an element of risk um, this year. And and we, we were asking Farker about this. You know, I, I asked him how much in the conversations with Leeds did you actually talk about having to get it done in 12 months? You know, how much were you talking about? Not that it's essential that it happens this season, but that everybody would like it to happen this season. And he said not so much. You know, he said it wasn't really part... There was far more spoken about medium term to long term. But I think he knows, and I, I did feel like he was trying to manage expectations slightly in what he was saying, where he said, you know, there might be a bit of a bumpy start. There's no way it can be perfect and everything sorted for August the 6th, which is, you know, true. Um, it's, it's not... In no way is everything going to be done by then. Um, but... Yeah, it, it can't take forever. This. How do you two view it? Then do you see it as a as a two year thing? This like we we because the parachute payments it's fifty five percent, isn't it, of central distributions? Then it drops to forty five, but then yeah. it's like twenty. Yeah, no, year three it goes down significantly, and then so after that, you it feels like you need to get it done in your first two, and you can take your financial risks in your first couple of years, but then year three you've kind of got to get your ducks in a row ready for year four potentially. Yeah, it's obviously not a choice we're going to have, mm. but it feels like this needs to happen this year. For me, I don't know. It feels like momentum will be lost if we get into a second year, and I don't think, even though the project that he had at Norwich started with a mid-table year, I think he'll struggle with that at Leeds. I feel like if we're if we're stuck in mid-table, there'll be calls for him to be sacked, and we'll bring someone else in. I think mid-table is a hard sell, isn't it? If you're in the running and you don't go up, um, bearing in mind that that it took Bielsa two years and it took Farker two years at Norwich as well. That's probably... I've been thinking about this quite a lot this week, about whether it's realistic for it to happen in these 12 months, given this summer, you know, given how tight the turnaround is, given how little time they do have to to sort everything out. I mean, you'll have seen other clubs starting pre-season friendlies already, other championship clubs, because the season finished um, earlier than the Premier League. Leeds obviously kick off against Man United in Oslo, next Wednesday um, it's it's going to be difficult it's it's going to be a challenge I think if they're in the running and they compete and compete fairly well and don't go up then it's very credible to say look you know Farker did this second time round at Norwich so stick with it and, you know, the, stick, and there's the recent the example program. of Bielsa isn't there as well so, it's yeah. Bielsa yeah. Um, and, and also Farker's done it twice before so you can as a, your championship winner so you can give some credence to the idea that, that it can be done again as Michael says, if you're a long way off the pace, then you are relying on people to show that bit more faith in that, you know, this can jump from being nowhere near to actually, you know, kind of leading the way and, and getting out of the division comfortably. Um, but yeah, I think it, it it's possible that it could be two years. Um, I think two years is probably the maximum um, that they've got. I think the difficulty into a second year as well is that the hope for this season is that we can main, maybe keep one of... Harrison or Nonso or Adams or someone like that, keeping them into a second year feels impossible. You've yes. got at that point, you've got to say, "All right, yep, yeah, fair enough. You gave it a go. Thank you for that." But yeah. sure enough, you can go a bit like we did with Phillips when we can, we convinced him to have another go at it. But if if we hadn't gone up the second time, he would have gone and yeah, no, no, absolutely, no one could have complained. Left. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm. So just do it in year one. Just get it. Yeah, why not? What, yeah. what, what, what do you say, Phil? Phil? Yeah, just win the fucker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at which point, I think we should leave it. <laughs> yeah, just it's just going to be the same message all season, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, that said, um, I think you know Farker said to us, people around here aren't 
dreamers, they are realistic. And I, I know what he's getting at, and I, I do feel like that. I is that can... since Radrazan is left? <laughs> I, I can see that it's not an easy job, this. It's not. It's never an easy job at Leeds, is it, ever? Um, but the circumstances that he's in at the moment, in no way is it simple. Do you know what would be nice? If somebody just came in, and I'm thinking about him in this example, and made it look easy, just for once. It would be lovely, wouldn't it? Like yeah. company last season, yeah. yeah. Just have a jolly nice time for a year. Imagine what that would be like. What would that feel like? <laughs> do you think if... Um, do you think if that had been Leeds under company, you'd have still been panicking in March? Um, because he would have been, been. You know when it's another club <laughs> that you've got no, there's, there's no dog in the fight and you're just watching from afar. So you sit going, oh, they're up already then, aren't they? Yeah, mm. they're laughing. Easy. Yeah. No problem. Um, it's never like that when it's yours. No. Ever. Especially no. not around here. Maybe this season. Maybe this is the season this when it all one. changes. Leeds were the first club to be 12 points clear at Christmas <laughs> and still not go up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We'll catch up with you uh, at the start of next week. We'll see you soon. The Square Ball Podcast. 